Okay, so it's doing its thing now. Okay, see it? Yeah. Okay, all right. Yay! <laughs> I think it's a time delay between what's showing on Facebook and what is actually showing on the Zoom call, so that's okay. Okay. All right. So, Ms. Shaw, thank you so much for deciding to have a conversation about gentrification. So I'm gonna let you open this up since this is your idea and I will follow your lead. Okay, well this, um, thank you again, Janine. Um, this is a conversation that you and I have had um, on occasions, occasions. And um, personally being able to assist um, homeowners in their opportunity to really live in has really um, kind of changed my mind about the stick of urban gentrification and, you know, how that has affected our community. So okay. with that, that um, I know you wanted to share some things, so I'm going to turn this back over to you. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Janine Hunter. I am a senior mortgage loan officer with We Lending. Um, and I will say that any comments expressed here are not the opinions of We Lending. They are expressly the opinions of Janine M. Hunter and the mortgage chat um, based upon over 25 years of mortgage lending. So let's get started when we talk about urban gentrification. When I did research on this topic yesterday, three key things came to my mind. One was the thing that they described as redlining, which as we know in the urban communities, redlining was a practice back in the 30s through the 60s. And some people even say today that exists. And what that meant was, was that banks, credit unions, mortgage companies would not lend to certain individuals in certain zip codes. And they were primarily minority serving communities in certain zip codes in most major cities. So that's what I would say was the precursor to urban gentrification. But to me, what led to the acceleration of gentrification is the fact that when minority, when integration happened in the late 1960s, and it afforded Black families the opportunity to move out into the suburbs. Many of them left the urban center, which was you know, tied to downtown. It was tied to most goods and services. That's where you had your tight-knit communities. So when the suburbs happened in the late 70s, early 80s, 90s, everything went out with them. The grocery stores went with them. The transportation went out with them. Retail establishment went with them. Um, but what stayed in the city was your small mom and pop shops, right. your, your liquor stores, your churches, yeah. and the bus lines. So as a consequence, the people who were left behind, if you will, were the persons who utilized those services, but they were not utilizing them to the point where they were profitable. So then you had more situations of where your stores left the inner cities and moved back out to the suburbs because based upon dollar and profit, which is what economic development is all based on, uh -huh. it, was more, it was more in their business model for them to be out in the suburbs and not be in the inner cities. So as a consequence, what happened was you had an older population who, for various reasons, either could not move because they could not afford to move or chose not to move because of the fact that that was their community. That's all they ever knew. This is where they had raised their children. This right. is where all their fam friends were, um, who their children had subsequently left behind because all the children went to the suburbs while the parents and grandparents stayed in the inner city. So as a consequence, what has happened is these neighborhoods have become what has been entitled disinvested. And what we mean by that is that banks have pulled out, they have become food deserts, they have become havens for investors because property is really, really, really cheap. 
Uh, yeah. Most of the times because the parents, grandparents have died off, left it to children. Children do not want the property. They want the asset gone. So as a consequence, they will sell it for pennies on the dollar. Or the area, as you know, in real estate, everything is about location, location, location. So right. it's not a good, quote unquote, location because there are no goods and services that would bring people back to those urban centers. Right. So I would say right in about the late 70s, you saw an influx of more affluent buyers wanting to move back into the cities. And for lack of a better term, it was the reverse of white flight, white mm -hmm and other non-minority communities were moving back into the cities because they no longer wanted to drive out to the suburbs. There was the opportunity for, uh, I know in Indianapolis anyway, all the bars and all the cultural things were downtown. And because that was a part of their lifestyle, they wanted to be closer to those entities. So you started seeing neighborhoods transition that were traditionally uh, low middle class, uh, urban tr transcending back into more affluent, high, uh, high class, upper middle class neighborhoods because as they came back in, the grocery stores came back in, the coffee shops came back in, the breweries came back in, the bookstores came back in. Mm -hmm. So as a consequence, the people who were left behind, they were what we would call a situation of being displaced and they were displaced because of the fact that their community no longer represented who they were or what their cultural norms were. Right. So what has happened is those that have chosen to stay in place do not understand their economic power. And what I mean by that is mm -hmm. because they are of the mindset that they cannot move, that they don't have the money to move, they cannot afford to move, uh, they are stuck. And right. the purpose of you and I having this conversation is to empower them to say that, yes, you can move, um, but you have to change your mindset about what it is that you're going to as opposed to what you're leaving from. And a lot of people, especially in our, in our culture, Tamara, we don't like change. So anytime anybody speaks of changing a mindset, changing a location, changing where we live, changing churches, you know, changing grocery stores, it's like, oh my God, you've said a four-letter cuss word. And that's not right. what it's about. What right. we as African Americans don't understand is everything is based upon economics, it's based upon the dollar. So yeah. when you see, and we joke about it, and it's not to be discriminatory in, in any manner. But we, we say as far as the, the urban or minority real estate professionals, when we see um, Caucasians walking their dogs in our neighborhoods or we see sidewalks coming in or we right. see um, other communities moving into our neighborhoods, that's when you know the neighborhood is getting ready to change and it's not going to be the neighborhood that you grew up in. It's not going to be the neighborhood that right. you raised your children in because now more things are going to come back that you may not be able to afford. And right. the key thing is, is that that's okay, that you cannot afford to stay there, but that means that you do have the funds to move to a different space that you can afford and live out your latter years in a quality of life situation, which is what you and I are discussing today. Because for example, I had a, a grandparent lived in his home 30 some odd years, the neighborhood went completely down, it was, uh, drug infested area. I grew up there, all my friends grew up there. But now when I look at that neighborhood, I wouldn't move back. And it's not because I can't afford to move back. I can't afford to move back. I just choose not to move back because there's no grocery stores. There's no pizza places. I've got to drive, you know, 20 minutes to get to a Walmart. Whereas where I live now in the suburbs, I'm 10 minutes from three different Walmarts. I'm less than five minutes from two grocery stores. And I've got a lot of fast food chains around me because that is my lifestyle. So yeah. you had clients that you have helped move um, mm -hmm. to a better space. And it's just recognizing when is the opportunity to let the property go so that you can continue to live, live out your last year's in a more comfortable space, as opposed to being in a property that may be ran down, 
is not worth what you paid for it initially years ago. And it's at a point where if you don't get out sooner rather than later, it can be taken from you due to non-payment of property taxes, eminent domain, or any other plan that the city comes up with in order to make your take your property in a sense away from you so that it can be put back into the economic base so that it can then be made they can increase the tax base so that they can bring the more affluent buyer back into that particular neighborhood so tamara i mean janine we are in the middle of a pandemic now i mean if there's ever an economic crisis we are in it now who would have thought a year ago you know, at the beginning of March 2020, that we would have seen impact um, to our economy the way we have just within the first month. And even though they are have so many the lenders, it's so bad with forbearances, with um, you know, extending the loans, and you know, even with evictions and the moratorium. You know, with all of the things in place, you know, in a minute, everything's going to come due. You know, um, if we are in a financial hardship now, I mean, if they're knocking on your door, if they're knocking on your door, you are getting bombarded with, you know, letters and postcards and people wanting your property. If you ever wanted an opportunity, this is your time to seize the moment. I mean, the opportunity of the market have shifted so much to where we don't have a lot of inventory. So really we're at a price, we're at a place where you can name your price. I mean, we can we can name our price if that's gonna be fair to you um, to uproot your life to for people to live again. I mean, it's a fair, it's a win-win. I mean, and we're in a season in real estate that it can help everybody. So one of the things that, that I would like to give you something to ponder and think about mm -hmm. is that if we want to keep our communities, our communities, there has to be what is called mixed income communities. And what I mean by that is you've got your entry level homes, yeah. um, which is affordable or actually not affordable is that step before affordable housing, because that's for people who will never be able to afford home ownership, no matter what you do, they are in a permanent rent situation. Right. Um, you've got to have protected rents, um, and whether it's housing or apartments, that's for that group of people. Exactly. Then you've got to have what is called affordable housing, in, and that's where most first time home buyers uh, fit into. So I don't care in whatever market you're in, because you're in the Nashville, um, Georgia market. I'm in the Indianapolis, Georgia market. It's, it's the same nationwide. You need to have housing where a person who's making between 12 to $15 an hour can afford a house. So you're looking at somewhere between that 90 to that 150 mark. That's yeah. where we would consider affordable housing. And then for those who have, you know, just graduated from school, have the good paying jobs, that's where that first time home buyer market fits in because they're right at that 150 to that 250 mark, depending upon which market you're in. And then you can have that move up buyer, uh, which is typically about 300 and up. But what has to happen is that you have to have private and public partnerships that would create those opportunities for those housing tracks. Right. And what I have seen in the area that I am in, and you can attest to the Nashville area, is that everybody has these 30-year plans about master plan communities, because that's what these are considered as master plan communities. But right. they don't have the boots on the ground that have the knowledge to create those affordable and below market rent opportunities. They just have the people who are interested in the 300 and plus up market. So right. every city has what is called opportunity zones that investors can get land very cheap and create affordable housing. 
what the issue that I've seen, particularly in the Atlanta market, is that these investors come in, but they still want to create that high-end housing. They don't want to create that affordable first-time home buyer market. So as right. a consequence, no matter what big city you go into, whether it's Detroit, Atlanta, yeah. Indianapolis, Nashville, you've got blocks yeah. of boarded up abandoned houses that are yeah. just sitting there yeah. because there's not anyone that has the foresight to create these affordable housing and first time home buyer opportunities because a lot of these houses, I know I can speak for Indianapolis, a lot of them need to be just torn down as built from the ground up. They, they, they can't be saved. They've yes. just been dilapidated um, mm -hmm. for too long. But what it is, is that you've got foreign investors who are sitting on this property because they know that the market is eventually gonna come back. So they're just biding their time until they can get the 300 to $500,000 opportunities for housing. But the people who are in those communities are still living in dilapidated or not really yeah. habitable housing. I was trying right. to find a more politically correct term to say it, but it, inhabitable. It's, just, it's, it's inhabitable. Inhabitable. Because you've got slum, slum lords who mm -hmm. just collect rent. They don't do anything on the properties. And the people don't understand, number one, tenants' rights, because they have to understand that they have the ability to contest the conditions that they're living in. They just don't know that they have the ability to do so. But right. number two, there's not enough organizations that are collectively trying to change the narrative. Everybody mm -hmm. has an idea of what should be done. But as I said earlier, there's no boots on the ground to actually do it. Right. So, you know, again, millennials are the ones who are driving Millennials and those baby boomers who are deciding to downsize, they're the ones who are driving this gentrification movement. Yeah. So what we have to do is teach the millennials how to go into these neighborhoods because they value that sense of community. They value that sense of green. They value the sense of urban transportation and all mm -hmm. that comes with it, which is what is a lot has been put forth in these master plan communities. And we have to teach them how to go in and see beyond the dilapidated structure that they're looking at now and do what is called a renovation loan in order to get it back to where they needed the house to be. Because everybody wants new. No one wants to go into a situation where there's a two bedroom, one bath house. Those just are not functional anymore. And when you look at most inner city or urban dwelling housing, there are either two ones, meaning a two bedroom, one bath, or there are three bedroom, one bath. A lot of them do not have garages. A lot of them are what we would call shotgun houses where if you shoot a shotgun, it could go straight from the front door to the back door. And people just are not living that way anymore. I mean, not even washing their hookup. That too. And <laughs> you know what <laughs> And when you go into the basement, sometimes there's there are dirt basements. Yeah. So, and in some communities, they're on sewer and septic. So mm -hmm. you've got to teach um, the millennials and people who want to move back into these communities how to take and leverage mortgage programs that are out there so that they can create that space of I still want to be in a quote unquote neighborhood. I want a front porch. I want to know my neighbors. I want to be able to park in front of my house safely <laughs> because a lot of times in your urban neighborhoods, um, there is a crime factor, but once gentrification does take place, the crime factor does go down. And at the same time, improve the schools because for a lot of people in our age group, we still are dealing with children, sometimes grandchildren, and we want to know that our children slash grandchildren are going to quality schools. And a lot of times in these urban environments, the schools don't have the programming or the options that we're looking for in order to make sure that our children get the best education. All right. So true. So you had a situation, Tamara, where you had a... a, a person who believed every, all the myths that we just talked about. Yeah. I have a home. I can't move. Um, I'm older. I'm seasoned. I don't know what to do. 
I know I'm tired of living in this, for lack of a better term, inhabitable situation, but I don't know what to do. I mean, who do I talk to? Because everybody that I know, number one, I don't want them in my business like that. That's number one. Number two, I don't know what questions to ask because I, I don't want to appear like I'm not handling my business. And it's just overwhelming to me. So Tamara, can you share what your experiences have been like? Yeah, I'm, um, I had the opportunity. Um, I, I went to my old neighborhood. I grew up in South Nashville. Uh, between 12th South and Wedgwood and uh, 8th Avenue South. And so when I, uh, a couple of years ago, I got in my car on Saturday morning and I was led to the actual street that I uh, grew up on. And the urban gentrification had already started in South Nashville. Um, And what we were seeing was our single family homes um, the, when the ones that were selling the ones next door, I mean, they were building gigantuan houses, um, and it was changing the aesthetics of the community, the aesthetics of the neighborhood. Um, uh, and I knocked on their door and just as soon as she opened the door, the first thing she said was, I'm ready to go. She said, do you see what they built up next to me? And, you know, just so happened, I was, I'm a realtor. Um, she didn't know I was in real estate at the time, um, but we finished the conversation. Um, the situation was so bad. You know, we can be, uh, we are a prideful people as a people, you know, um, they did not want me to come in their home. We done the deal on the front porch. She was so embarrassed for me to step inside her home. However, she was sitting on prime real estate. She was sitting on prime property. Um, we put the properties out, we put the property out there on the market. Um, we were in contract within 10 days. Uh, we got a cash offer, uh, 705,000 cash. Um, there was a cash close, no appraisals, didn't worry about inspections because again, they knew they were going to tear them down. They knew Mm -hmm. what they were going to do with them. So it didn't matter about being on the inside, uh, of the property. You know, um, but actually, when I did get into the property, um, this family, they didn't even have bed. Um, they were sleeping in recliners. You know, they had a big bud infection, infestation so bad in the home for a number of years that they had to go to bed, you know. Um, it just, and they lived, and, and it was a, a family of four, a son, grandmother, mother. Um, and again, they owned the home for 50 something years. Uh, house paid for, uh, them with the opportunity, and they were able to stay within the South Nashville community. You know, they were able to buy a house cash on off of Franklin Road. Um, they were able to still live uh, mortgage free. You know, um, but they got a better home. You know, um, when they first moved into the home and we closed on it, they would call me just about every day just to thank me um, because they didn't see where they could do this. They didn't see where they could pay for 450 cash for a home, but still have $100,000 left over in the bank and you know, work for the state. She still wants to work every day. Um, but it's the difference when you can go to work and you know your bills are paid. You know, you know, you have a different perspective on retirement when you know you already have a safe of retirement. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the, the mother was 90 years old. Um, she thought she was living in a hotel. You know, she woke up and said, talking about what time we got to check out of here. They had to convince her, no, we own it, you know? So, um, I mean, these are opportunities. I had another 78-year-old lady that uh, wanted to sell her home. Three-bedroom, one-bath, shotgun-style house, never had washer and dryer. Um, we only could do her deal for less than $200,000. Um, but we were able to sell at 180000 she still owed 50000 on her property, um, but I showed her where we could still pay cash for her property. We had to change counties, but in the event of us changing counties, she was able to get a three-bedroom, two-bath house with wash and dry connection. And she didn't mind the travel because she finally lived 
in a dream where she didn't have to share a bathroom anymore and she didn't have to leave her home to wash her clothes. I mean, it's just the simple things in life that people begin to appreciate that they don't think that they can have even at 70 and 60 and 80 years old, but uh, it's possible. It is, it's definitely possible. I know when my grandfather passed, and, and I know that this is a, a thought pattern within the, the African community is that, I mean, African-American community is that when we die, we want to leave our kids the house because we couldn't leave them or take care of them, quote unquote, the way we wanted to in life. So we, in death, we can bequeath this money. Right. Excuse me, when my grandfather died, hmm, the house was worth about $22,000. Uh -huh. There was six siblings. Mm -hmm. Six. So by the time this, the sale was over with, everybody got about $4,000. Four. Four. And this is after my grandfather had put a brand new roof on the house, brand new AC on the house brand new siding on the house. Um, he didn't do anything on the, on the inside, but he made sure that the exterior was taken care of. <laughs> Excuse me. And I say all that to say this. I would have much rather my grandfather had sold that house and moved to a different neighborhood to whereas he was safer. Uh -huh. um, I actually grew up in the house. Um, I actually stayed in the house off and on, on up, almost up until the time that he died. Um, but I wish he would have got out sooner rather than when he did, because his life could have been much richer because he could have left more of a legacy to his, his children, as opposed to $4,000. But, you know, our thing is we work, we pay the house off. We think, okay, we've left our children something. Right. But unfortunately, when we don't get out at the height of the market, which is now, uh -huh. and it becomes a, a buyer's market, uh -huh. we lose the opportunity to actually set up, leave that, that optimal legacy. Yes, he still left his children a legacy. Yeah. But what could it have been? He moved to a different neighborhood where when he died, his house was worth $150,000 and he could have left his children, you know, 10 or $20,000 a piece as opposed to the four. Yeah. And my uncle was, a, well, God rest his soul, I will say that. Love him to death, but he was a slumlord, okay. And he bought property in the hood thinking that, oh, the neighborhood's coming back. By the time they get to my block, you know, I'll be able to get, you know, all these tens of thousands of dollars for this property. Yeah. He yeah. died uh -huh. and um, he died five years ago. And as a consequence, the property is worth less than what he paid for it when he bought it 10 years prior. Uh -huh. And the reason why I say that is because it's set on an alley. Yeah. The drug addicts have went in and taken all the copper and all the furnaces and HVAC and everything out of the house. There had been squatters in the house. They had literally destroyed that property. So uh -huh. what he initially had paid, I think we got it on a tax sale for like 12 to 15,000. My cousin still owns the property because she was the executor of his estate. Mm -hmm. And she's trying to sell it for 10. Now, okay. figure this. He owned the property at least 10 years before he passed. Okay. She's just trying to sell it for the 10 to get out of it now. I can't get that. Wow. So, love him dearly. But I told him, don't buy all this property yeah. in areas that the neighborhoods are downturning because you will not be able to survive right. the whole time that it's going to take for it to come back. Yes, they have made strides in that neighborhood that he bought that house, but mm -hmm. they're at least still two blocks east of his house 
and possibly about another 15 years before they get that area back to where they want it to be because it isn't the master plan. Yeah. But look at what he lost. Mm -hmm. And most of the property that he bought, um, because mm -hmm. again, he thought buying real estate in these neighborhoods, I was going to be able to leave a legacy for his children. Mm -hmm. His children are ending up selling the properties for pennies on the dollar because they're just not worth anything. Mm -hmm. So you can have the right intentions to try and build a real estate portfolio for your children. But mm -hmm. if you don't buy right because mm -hmm. you're not listening to the real estate professionals, which I was a realtor at the time, and I'm sure you can attest to this as well, when people don't want to listen to your knowledge base, yeah. And when you can see the trends, you have access to information that the common person does not have access to because you're in those meetings. Yeah. When a person sets intentionally sets themselves up for failure, only thing you can do is just finish the transaction and let them do what it is that they're going to do because they're not willing to listen to you. And a lot of times in our community, People are not willing to listen because they're always trying to think of a way that they can circumvent the system <laughs> and work around the system as opposed to working in the system to get the <laughs> knowledge that you need to have. So if you want to come out of the system, you've got the tools and the resources to be able to effectively build your real estate portfolio. So for example, and this is off the topic, but in the topic as well, you know, a lot of communities, especially in your older cities, I don't know about Nashville, but I could say in Indianapolis, for example, we have a lot of four unit properties, mm -hmm. duplexes, three units, four units. OK, now the trend is everybody wants to, quote unquote, house hack. And that's where you buy one unit as an owner occupied, that's rent crazy. the other three units um, and they become income streams that pay for not only the mortgage on the property, but if priced right, can provide you with some additional income so that you can go out and buy further investment properties. Mm -hmm. Well, on Clubhouse, which is a podcast for um, iPhone users, mm -hmm. there are people who are saying, well, you can go buy one unit FHA, the four unit, and then go buy the next four unit FHA, because they're thinking, oh, I can skirt the system and not get caught. Mm -hmm. That does not work, okay? That mm -hmm. does not work. It does not even work conventional because the thing about it is, is that when you are buying those properties as an owner occupant, an mm -hmm. underwriter has to sign off on that mortgage. So the first four unit makes sense, okay? Yeah. Right. But if you want to buy another investment property that is not a single family mm -hmm. and another two to three, four unit the underwriter's got to say, well, okay, why are you moving from one four unit mm -hmm. to another four unit that's not 100 miles away? You haven't had an increase in family size. You're not in a situation where you're divorcing. And I forget what the fourth one is, but if you ain't fit in three of the four criteria, most people do not, mm -hmm. then why would I sign for you to get another four unit? Mm -hmm. So again, people are trying to figure out how can I circumvent the system and get build this real estate portfolio? Yeah. And that's the thing about, they used to say down south or out west weather where people go sell uh, swamp land in Florida mm -hmm. and tell you that it's this big, nice uh, piece of land. And when you get there, it's nothing but swamp and it's inhabitable. Mm -hmm. You have to have real estate professionals that are knowledgeable about what's going on in your communities. And too many times we don't want to trust the person with the knowledge. You want to trust the person who tells us what we want to hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people will say, oh, well, gentrification is bad for the black community. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. But we have to take ownership in that. And the reason why I say we have to take ownership in that is number one, if we had viable businesses that could go back into these storefronts, then we can have black owned businesses in those storefronts. But mm -hmm. most of our businesses, number one, are service businesses, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, they only employ one person, me. Mm -hmm. 
And number three, they're not generating enough income to where as they can employ other individuals. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. when you look at these other communities mm -hmm. of color, the Chinese mm -hmm. shops, when you look at the Chinese shop, everybody in there that works is Asian. When you look yep. at your Hispanic grocery stores, everybody that works in there is Hispanic. But we as African Americans have this crab in the barrel syndrome to whereas we don't want to support each other, number one. And number two, we don't want to help each other to get to the, to the next level. So as a consequence, if we had a nail shop, because we got plenty of black nail techs, <laughs> if, we had, if we took a strip center mm -hmm. and there was seven storefronts in that strip center and you had a nail salon, you had a beauty hair supply because we buy more hair than any other culture that there is out there. We have mm -hmm. a food restaurant because, you know, we like to eat. <clears throat> Uh -huh. If we deposited our money and kept it in the bank, as opposed to going to these check cash in places and not having uh, checking and savings accounts, banks would stay in our neighborhoods because what happens is the reason why banks come out is because the money does not stay in the bank in our neighborhoods. Right. right. We just go there to cash our checks. Uh -huh. Banks don't make money that way. They make right. money on deposits on uh, mortgages, on car loans, on money market accounts, et cetera. We as a culture, for the most part, do not support those activities. So as a consequence, because I used to work for a bank, it's in my background, that's why we pulled out of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it costs more for us to be there when we weren't getting the return on the investment due to the lease, due mm -hmm. to the security that we had to hire because it was always getting robbed. Right. And the vandalism that was being done on the building. So yeah. uh, again, I go back in that seven front storefront, if you have a nail salon, a hair salon, a bank, a restaurant, um, if you had enough to support a black owned drug store mm -hmm. or store. a small, grocery store to whereas you're not charging such a high price on the same goods and services that I can go to Walmart and get, then you're building that infrastructure for that community to be able to support the people that is living in that community, as well as attract your more affluent Black people back to the community. Because I had a conversation with a girlfriend yesterday, as a matter of fact, and I said, well, would you move back to your community that she grew up in? And she's like, no. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? I have to be honest. I wouldn't either. Because mm -hmm. number one, my lifestyle has changed. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, the goods and services that I value are out in the suburbs. So right. until they bring those back to the city where I'm at, to whereas I don't have to get in my car and drive mm -hmm. more than five to 10 minutes, it's better for me to stay out in the suburbs. Plus, I like where my house is now, I have land between me and the next door neighbor. And in most cities, the way that the plots are laid out, I'd have to buy two lots in order to have enough frontage because I want my house to be wide as opposed to a four square. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you got to put all that into uh, the conversation. But as I said, we as Black professionals who have quote unquote made it, we still living out in, in the exurbs and the suburbs. We have no intentions of moving back. Right. So Robin Anderson. Go ahead. She asked, she asked a question. Robin Anderson. She said, why is it, why is this different when African Americans start moving in white neighborhoods? Property goes down. It's perception. Mm -hmm. It's perception that. African Americans are not going to keep the properties up. Mm -hmm. and, and as a consequence, that really happened in the 70s when after integration in 1968 mm -hmm. and the Civil Rights Bill of 1968, and Blacks had the ability to move into white neighborhoods, you saw white flight, and that's when they moved even further out. And right. I mean, to keep it 100, they ain't always wrong about that. <laughs> Because, you know, we don't keep our, our, our neighborhoods, our, our, our properties up. 
I mean, this is why we're having the topic. This is why we're having the conversation. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. And a lot of it, too, is because we buy more house than we can afford. Um, that's our biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, once we buy the new house, then we got to buy the new furniture and the new car to go in the new house because we can't move into the new house with the old furniture and the old car. See, that doesn't keep up with the Joneses. Mm. Mm. So then as a consequence, not only do we have a car note, a higher house note, and this furniture, then, you know, I got to go to TJ Maxx every week and buy that Michael Kors purse that's $200 that's staring me in my face. And then because I don't like cooking on a daily basis, I got to eat out two to three times a week. So as a consequence, when the house needs to have repairs on it, guess what? Ain't no money to fix it. Nobody to fix it. So then what we want to do is, especially with the roof, we want to call it in on the insurance, the homeowner's insurance to fix that roof. Because isn't that what the homeowner's insurance is for? No. No. It is no. not. So what people don't understand is that every time you call in a claim on that homeowner's insurance to fix something inside your house because you got the money but don't want to take your money to do so, you get what is called a claim, and that claim then causes your homeowner's insurance to go up. Uh -huh. So I don't think you're going to find more than one claim in the middle of it, even if you have two disasters in one year. They will drop you right. on your next time. <laughs> on your next time. So if you have a car accident and you hit that homeowner's insurance and both of them are under the same carrier, yeah, you ain't getting renewed. You and when you, do get re when you do go to your next provider, that claim history follows you. And your rates are high. That's right. And then don't have bad credit. Because see, your, your homeowner's insurance and your car insurance rates are based upon your credit scores. Right. So if you got bad credit uh -huh. and you got claims, uh -huh. your stuff is going through the roof. Yes. Really and is. unfortunately, you got to pay it because you got to have a place to live. Yeah. But the bad side of that is that house becomes even more not affordable. Right. So you get yourself into a, a, a vicious cycle, which I was on Clubhouse earlier today mm -hmm. uh, talking about credit because, you know, everybody wants to get their credit together to, to buy a house. And, and the thing about it is, People, we only need three lines, three, three, three lines three. of credit to buy a house. Yeah. I don't need 10. That's right. Because this is the thing. We traditionally, I'll say, and I'll put that traditionally, make less than what our, our, our white counterparts make. And if we're fortunate enough to make close to what our counterparts make, and we have bad credit, we're still gonna pay more for our houses, our cars, our insurance, and our credit cards. It's just a reality because everything is based upon credit score. So what you can do is try and build that credit so that you keep your accounts at 30% utilization or less. But if you've got 10 cards and all of them are maxed out, uh -huh. and you have no cash, you are not a good credit risk. Right. I don't care if your scores are a 680 or above. You are still not a good credit risk because you don't have the cash that is liquid to be able to take care of your financial obligations. Right. So I say all that to say this, because this is a true story. You have to listen to people who are in real estate if you're wanting to buy and finance a house, just because they work for the bank and they are the assistant branch manager does mm -hmm. not mean that they know how to finance a house. Mm -hmm. If the person does not have a seven digit number behind their name, which I have a seven digit number behind my name, my, my number is 1780411. That means that I have taken a test and I have been in the business for 25 years. So I know what it is that I'm talking about, okay? 
uh, if they have not take, had at least taken the test mm -hmm. and got at least 12 months under their belt, don't listen to them. Because I, this client that I had, he went and got a consolidation loan because the banking professional told him to get a, a consolidation loan to pay off all his credit cards. He paid off all of his credit cards, but still left the accounts open, which totally defeated his purpose. Really? And so he got upset with me because I said to him, look, I understand what it was that you was trying to do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you shot yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. Because the thing about it is, unless those accounts are closed, we're going to assign 5% of the outstanding high credit limit as your monthly payment because we don't know if you have went and charged on those accounts since the time the account was paid off and the time that I pulled your credit. Right, right. So a question it, from McClurkin, Ms. McClurkin. She says, should we believe our home value on Zillow or should we get an appraisal to see our home value? Well, Ms. Realtor, I'm going to defer that question to you because I would no. say no. No. <laughs> no. No, you shouldn't believe Zillow uh, for your home value because, again, um, you know, it, it's really, it, it has its own algorithm system. So I, I don't know how it actually works when it comes down to um, how they come up with some home values. Um, it could be more, it could be less, you know, again, it, it, you, you just never know with Zillow. Um, as far as an appraisal, I mean, you can always get an appraisal because again, it's going to give you um, a more accurate uh, home value versus, uh, versus Zillow. But I mean, you know, a, a representative, a great realtor, representative can really pull some great comps to kind of get you in that uh, frame of what your house would kind of appraise as when it looks as to the conditions of it um, compared to the other home area and that type of thing. And from a lending perspective, what we're looking for, what the appraiser is looking at is bedrooms to bedrooms, bathrooms to bathrooms, uh, the square footage of the house to the square footage of the house basement to basement, garage to garage, land. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the main things that they're looking at as far as coming up with a value for your property. And they want to do that within a mile of your specific residence. If they have to go out beyond the mile, then they have to give justification as to why they went outside that mile radius. And so a lot of people get frustrated or aggravated, especially in this market, because a lot of people, especially on the purchase side, they're doing highest and best. And when we get the appraisals back on the lending side, we are challenging those because the, the appraiser had to go so far out to get that information. Right. So, so, and we're only looking at, and they're only really looking at sales within the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. And I was going to also say that um, what we what I'm what we're really saying is that a lot of homes, you know, people kind of done their own home renovations and did pull permits on add room or putting a certain type of square footage, and uh, you know, it, it it's more than just a door to consider a room a bedroom. You know, it has to have a closet. It has to have you know, certainly to be considered a bedroom. So, you know, you're also seeing people trying to, you know, generate more square footage than is actually really there, uh, get more for their money. So you have to kind of really um, validate those, um, the square footage of it and the, you know, the rooms. On the so I know here in, in, in the Atlanta market, uh, a lot of people have redone their basements to make them into rental units. So they'll put bedrooms, bathrooms down there. But unless it has an exterior doorway, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. just a finished basement. Right. 
we can't count those bed, we can't count those bedrooms or that bathroom. Right. So that's why when you are doing your renovations, as a lot of realtors say, DIY killed killed the market for realtors because a lot of people thought, oh, I could go in and add you know this to the house and add this to the house. What you want to do is make renovations that make sense. So what sells houses, Tamara? Kitchens, bathrooms, kitchens. I'm sorry. You know what I'm saying? That's what sells houses. That's what sells. Yeah, absolutely. So those are the renovations you should focus on. Right. Right. What else sells? What other kinds of renovations sell houses? Adding another Uh, unit. So for example, if you have the space, which I saw this in, in, in Georgia, like you said, somebody did it to do, do it yourself method because it just it just didn't make sense. They were trying to create another bedroom, but you had to go through a, a one room to get into the bedroom. So there was no quote unquote hallway. So you have to design your renovation so that it has pop, it has ingress and egress, meaning in an in way and an outway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times when we want to do it ourselves, we want to, for lack of a better term, rig it, rig it. and it just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. I went in one the other night and I, it, it was a, a one car garage type home. And when we pulled in the driveway, the garage door is gone and they have French doors there. So we go into the house to go into the garage and it was, it was a half unfinished um i guess they were going to turn it into a den however it was still concreted you know for a garage they did do the drywall against the concrete on a part on a portion of the garage you know but again you know we we still have to count it as a garage i mean (laughs) it's not finished living space it's not finished living space right So, you know, one thing that our community has to embrace that other communities have embraced a long time ago is that your first home is not your forever home. Yes, that's what I tell my clients all the time. And this is the vehicle to get you to your forever home. Yes. And especially in the market that we're in right now, Tamara, would you agree that's a seller's market? It is. I mean, you have in this market, I mean, you can get your forever home. I will go as far as saying that. (laughs) I mean, you can get your forever home now. If you ever wanted to move again and, you know, you, you know, you've been in your home 30, 40 years, you know, you, you won't change. This is not the home want to retire you're about to retire you can get you can have your forever home uh, selling your home can put you in your forever home right you know, um you're you know it, it, you have the 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 means to do what you need to do to prepare for retirement i mean especially with the economy the way it is right you know it, we, you're muted we would and, not have that conversation if um, it wouldn't be relevant if we were not in the uh, economic crisis that we're finding ourselves in now. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it was just the timing was right just to have this conversation because again, you know, um, we don't want to be frustrated with the fact that, you know, the economy is changing, you know, what are we going to do? You know, we don't know whether our jobs are going to, you know, um, how, how they're going to stay. You know what what's going to happen you know so if we're ever seeking any desire for change or you know a way out or your second chance to live again you know a fresh start to say for us you know this is your fresh start this is your opportunity right but you you said a key phrase you said if you have a home to sell yeah yeah see most of my first time home buyers want that forever home yes And in the market that we are in right now, a lot of, I specialize in buyers who have credit scores from 580 to 660 who need down payment assistance. That is what my market is. 
Right. Sellers are not paying closing costs. I don't care if you are in New York, Dallas, Nashville, Atlanta, San Francisco. Sellers are not paying closing costs. Sellers are not, for the most part, accepting FHA offers. They want conventional. And conventional, that's right. So when you are in a situation to where as rates are really good, they, they, they have gone up in the last two weeks, but they're still below what they were in July of 2020. We're at 3% now. Uh, the upper twos are still available if you're willing to pay some discount points. Mm -hmm. Thing is, is that you've got to get in where you can fit in when you have no money. You do. I agree. And I'm just, I'm just keeping it 100. But the thing about it is, if you buy in this market, it's getting ready to shift again. So when it shifts again, you've now got some equity, as Tamara was referring to, because mm -hmm. in the examples that she gave, the buyer's houses was paid off. Mm -hmm. So they sit in, in fact, she's got a potential listing right now where the, the buyer is sitting on $700,000 worth of equity and and she's trying to get them in, into the next home. And their mindset, keywords mindset, is that they don't have the money to move. Right. Now, everybody's not as fortunate enough to have $700,000 worth of equity. But even if you're sitting on 50, with the way that the rates are now, right. that is at the point that that can put you into your move up home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you've been in your home over 10 years at this point, some people just need to, to cut their losses and just sell what they can get out of it for right now. Because I mean, I sold for 180. I mean, one I mean 180,000. We still right. had 50,000 of a second mortgage, okay? Because see, sometimes when we have our house paid off, we just need more money. And it's right. not necessarily to fix nothing. We just want more money. I don't know why we're refinancing our homes and we're not putting it back into our homes. But that's well, what, because that. we done got into some credit card debt. That's another lie. <laughs> and we need we want to help our grown kids. Because you know, some of them have some criminal issues that they need yeah. money. So that's why we end up doing it. That's but what do. I'm saying is, is the fact that when you have money to work with and the rates are as low as they are mm -hmm. that will allow you to be able to buy that move up home because now that move up home if you can't keep your payments the same you're not going up that much to whereas it's right. not affordable right i mean we were still able to buy cash at ninety two thousand. i'm buy a house for cash at ninety two thousand. right and right. she still put thirty thousand in a saving money market account Right. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it may not be 300,000 that we can say, but you can start with something. 30,000 was good for her. You know what I'm right. saying? She was happy to have 30,000 on a fixed income that she has sitting in just a savings account. Right. You know. And, and then we have to think about paying be. the taxes on uh, the the monies as well. You right. know. So that's why it's so important if you're going to sell that you take those funds and you put that into your next home because you got to account for that money. You right. Unless you're starting a business or putting it into another house, there, there are some tax penalties. So you definitely want to consult a tax consultant. You do. You, you definitely do. want to do that. So, you know what? We've been talking for a long time. Girls, almost an hour. And you know, okay. I can keep going forever. Are you good? I am. I mean, we have some viewers. Uh, Miss Vicki Peterson said, I am loving it. So she just posted that. So, I mean, we can keep talking. Okay. I have another 10, 15 minutes. You good? Okay. Well, what, yeah, I'm good. What I want to talk about next is getting our sugar, honey, iced tea together. <laughs> Our sugar, <laughs> our honey, 
our iced tea together. And that's a nice way of saying our salaries, our homes, our investments, and our tax structures that's together. Good. Isn't that good? Got it from another realtor partner, but she she wanted to put another letter in there because she didn't like the sugar honey iced tea. So I don't have a problem with the sugar honey iced tea, but some I have no problem with. <laughs> but the reason why I say all that is to say this. Yeah. The tax code was written for homeowners and for business owners. Okay. So if, and I'm doing this backwards because they kind of all intermingle with each other. So mm -hmm. with the tax code and being written for homeowners and for business owners, if this pandemic has shown all of us anything, mm -hmm. is that number one, there's opportunities even in pandemic. It is. People have made a lot of money yes. in this pandemic. Yes. Don't don't let it, don't be fooled by that. Don't That's be number, fooled. One. number one. That's right. Number one. Number two, a lot of people have started businesses in this pandemic. Right. So whatever your, your passion is, whatever your purpose is, this time should have been utilized in order to get that into a business that is going to bring in some income for you. Right. Because you have to have multiple streams of income, which is where that salary piece comes in. Yeah. You want to get to a point where your money's working for you as opposed to you working for it. Right. Right. So... Poor, poor little Tink Tink. I just wanted to, to, you know, put this woman and just hug her. Because she she wanted to buy a $200,000 house. And I was like, sweetheart, you make $9 an hour. Mm -hmm. You cannot afford a $200,000 house. Yeah. And she had student loans. Mm -hmm. So my thing is, what did you go to school for and amount this debt for that you have a $9 an hour job? Right. And I'll be the first to admit, I got $138,000 in student loans. I do. That is an undergraduate degree and a graduate degree. Have I made what my degrees are worth? No. Mm -hmm. But I'm not making $9 now. Right. That's so, it. you know, I've it's been 25 years. It's been 25 long years. But I finally got myself to a point where now I'm in my purpose. So because I'm in my purpose, I believe that God's going to open up the doors for that money to come through. Right. But I had to go through some things to get to that purpose. OK, so now my salary is going to fall in line. Number two, homes, which is what we were talking about now. Mm -hmm. If you can afford to get into something, get into something. It's not your forever home. It's your starter home. It's your investment property piece. You know what I'm saying? It's right. either an investment property that you're going to rent out or it's an investment property that you're going to use to get to your next property. But either way, it's an investment. Right. Number one, you're getting tax write-offs on it because you're a homeowner. And number two, you're building wealth because you, you, you've got equity that if you want to take and pull out, you can pull out to start your business. Uh -huh. The greatest thing that a person could ever do is put a business in a room in a home in their room uh, in a room in their home because then you could write off a portion of the rent, the utilities, and everything else based upon the square footage of that rent of that room that you utilize to rent for your office. Uh -huh. Then you want to take that business and pay your children because if you pay your children a salary, again that's lowering your tax implications so please consult a tax consultant so they can they can tell you how to do this you're not tax professionals a tax professional you definitely want to get your investments in order and what i mean by that is people please have life insurance please have life insurance i just buried my mother it will be a year ago a year next month my mother had a ten thousand dollar life insurance policy we had to cut all kinds of corners to get that $10,000 policy to pay for her funeral expenses. Uh -huh. 
Mm -hmm. She could not leave us anything because she did not have the foresight to plan to leave us something. I had to force her to get a life insurance policy six years before she passed. Mm -hmm. And we just got past the time that we could pay it out when she passed. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have life insurance, at least have life insurance to take care of your funeral expenses so that your children do not have to worry about how they are going to help with your final expenses. But you want to have life insurance that not only builds cash value, but also you're able to leave a legacy for your children. I mean, think about it. I would love to be in a position to have children where I could at least leave them $100,000 so they can either buy a house or have a nice down payment for a house, pay off their college education if they have to have student loans, or start a business. That's what life insurance should be about. Right. Also, making sure that you, if you are W-2, make sure you're investing in your 401k. You are not going to miss that 3% that they are taking out of your paycheck. And then your employer is going to match on top of that. So if you're not taking advantage of it, you're, you are leaving money on the table. Mm -hmm. And so many times for African-Americans, and, 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 and I, I, I'm 100% transparent. Anybody knows me, tell, knows I'll tell like it is. My mom, God rest her soul decided that she wanted to take advantage of her social security at 55. Mm -hmm. She took a penalty because she was under the age of 59. Wow. We still had to help supplement her income because what she made in her latter years was not enough to cover the full expense time that they projected that she was going to need her social security for. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of our seniors are in that particular situation. So if you're in a, especially if you're a senior and you're in a home that's paid for, please get a reverse mortgage. Please. 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 Because there's no need for you. There's no reason why you should be concerned about how you're going to pay for your food and medicine when you have an asset that is free and clear. And I'm sorry, your grown children need to be able to take care of themselves because you got to take care of you. And I'm just keeping it 100. And listen, if they leave you the life insurance policy, please bury them first before you won't spend the money on yourself. <laughs> that yeah. part. I mean, I was at the funeral. I mean, we were at the, the, the funeral home at the table. You know, I mean, my grandmother just died. She only had three kids. I mean, you know, out of the three siblings, one said, I'm not signing over my portion to bury her. That's my money. That's your money. What do you mean that's your money? See, that's, that's money. That. I don't choose to bury her with my money. You don't that's choose to bury that. your mama with her life insurance policy that she left you beneficiary for, and you don't want to use your money. Not to bury my mama. See, that's that's a whole nother lie because you got to make sure you got the right people in the right seats as far as the executor of your affairs, because that can get really ugly really quick. I got family members now who are speaking to each other okay. um, because of the fact of how money was was divvied up. I mean, I was fortunate enough to whereas I didn't count on my mother leaving me anything because I knew she couldn't. Right. But and my siblings were the same way. But as I said, I got family members now who ain't speaking to folks because my relatives made decisions that they should not have made. And as a consequence, the kids aren't speaking to each other now. But again, I still love all my cousins dearly, but that's between, as far as I'm concerned, that's between the parent and God. I ain't got nothing to do with that. But <laughs> that's a whole conversation in itself. But then taxes. I mean, you should not be getting a five and $6,000 tax refund. The government is keeping your money and not paying you any interest. And then what you want to do is go out and buy big screen TVs, your Michael Kors purses, and take vacations. Mm -hmm. If you are not a homeowner, I need you to take and save that money for your down payment on your house. Mm -hmm. And you should have your taxes set to the point that you either owe 200 or you get 200 back. Yeah. Because then you're getting full utilization of your money and not being in a situation where Uncle Sam is using your money 
and for lack of a better term, pimping you and not giving you nothing out on the back end. That's right. Yeah. Now I always owe because I'm single income, no kids, and I don't have enough write-offs. So I always owe. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I never get the privilege of having mm -hmm. the big tax returns. But I see my clients because you know mm -hmm. they got kids and then they claiming kids that ain't theirs. And I'm like, y'all, we got to stop that. We, we got to stop that because they eventually gonna catch up to you. Well, I miss those days. You know, I'm an empty nester now, so I, I can't claim nobody. They claim themselves now. <laughs> well, I, I had a client that I was pre-approving the other day and his tax preparer one year put the same names one year as nephews and the next year put them as son and daughter. And I was like, sweetheart, I need you to go back and correct this because they are his nephews <laughs> and yeah so I need you to correct that but as I said we need to get our sugar honey iced tea together and there are conversations that we should be having with our children when they are small so that when they are adults they don't make the, the mistakes that we made as we were adults because I don't know about your household, Tamara, but, you know, my family operated and still to this day operate. What goes on in my house stays in my house. And guess what? Everybody was broke. That's right. And nobody could figure out how to get out of it. You know what I'm saying? And as a consequence, you know, we all got generational what I call wealth curses that we are carrying on this day because nobody sat down and, and had the conversations about, you know, how to effectively manage money, how to balance your needs versus your wants, how to make sure even in going to college that you're going to the, the school that's going to get you the, the right opportunity so that you don't have to pay $138,000 back of student loans. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, just having those meaningful conversations and, and bringing this all back to gentrification, which is how we started this conversation off um, a little bit over an hour ago. Okay. Gentrification, it's, been that long. it's been that long. Gentrification is not all bad. No. Oh. It just depends upon where you are in your life circumstances as to whether or not it makes sense to stay where you are, or mm -hmm. if it makes sense to pick up your bags and move on. And for a lot of, especially our seniors, yeah, I understand that you want to stay where it's familiar and, and, and where, you know, your, your few little friends are that you can say, hey, miss so-and-so as they walking up and down the street. But for your safety, if it's better for you to be in a more safe and secured location. Um, my personal opinion is I would rather see you be in that more safe and secured location. Right. Absolutely. And it's so important. You know, and another thing, you know, you know, we, we don't understand what it means when a matriarch uh, or patriarch passes away and the strain it, it leaves on the sibling and uh, you know if if we have property you know um make sure our parents you know if you have parents in their 80s and 90s please make sure there's a will in place you know oh see that's that's a whole nother girl we can you know, have I mean, the conversation those, on that yeah i mean those are so important but if, if you are you know 80 and 90 and you you have a home you know i i tell i i encourage them to sell now you know what I'm saying? And distribute the money, then you ain't got nothing to worry about. Because again, what ends up happening, you know, families, you know, they really don't take care of the property. You know, especially if they're not even living in the home with the matriarch, you know, they don't have the upkeep for it. But they want to keep the home. They're trying to make sense of it, you know. Then you have to worry about trying to split it up between umpteen siblings and you know, if it's a deceased sibling, then the, their children get involved. I mean, it gets quite, it gets quite dramatic, you know. Um, you, after you, you being nice. Say, it say. gets ugly. You know, death brings out the worst in people. Yeah. You will see what people are truly made of when it comes to death and, and, and money. 
And, you know, so many times we as a culture don't want to talk about that because it's morbid. But the thing about it is, is that if there is not written instructions and the siblings are not on one accord, people literally fall out and do not speak to each other. They, They become dead to each other because of the fact that Everybody remembers what mom and daddy said when they were with mom and dad. Right. <laughs> they don't remember what mom and daddy said when the other sibling was with mom and daddy. Right. So that's why it's, it's best to put everything um, in writing. My mother did put Boy. some things in writing, but uh, but again, it's all in all all in which the mindset that that you go into that situation. And I don't know about you, Tamara, but I'm the oldest. So with me being the oldest, you know, I kind of knew I didn't have any expectations because I didn't need my mother to pro- provide me with anything because I I have a house, I have a car, you know, I'm I'm taking care of myself. So I didn't have the expectation that I needed, you know five or six thousand dollars from my mom what I wanted from my mom was the pictures mm-hmm. I wanted the family pictures because I'm a historian um, I'm putting together my family's uh family tree so those the, the sentimental things is what mattered to me and my siblings were gracious enough to let me have that because they knew that my mother would want me to have those things my siblings kept my mother's condo Number one, because they was living with her. But number two, because they ain't got no other place to go right now. You know what I'm saying? So, but I was, cool with, I was cool with that because I have a house. So, yeah. you know, it's like, but, you know, in, in some families, you know, they argue over the sp- the teaspoons. It, it gets that petty. So that's why it's important to have that that will that last will and testament in place because people get petty about that stuff, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's unfortunate. It is because so, usually the ones that's hollering the most yeah. wasn't the ones that take care of them when their parents needed them the most, and and that's why they fussing because it's guilt. Oh, it's yeah. guilt that is eating them up alive. Yeah, yeah. You know, Janine, we're going to wrap this thing up, but I wanted to just leave this and I'll let you close it out. But, you know, one of the things that I was grateful for um, was that I was able to help people pandemic. And I say that to say uh, both of my sellers died of COVID last year. Mm -hmm. And with them both dying of COVID, um, I was able to put them in their dream home uh, prior to you know right. um so they were able to live a better quality of life before their life expired you know um that gave my heart so much joy uh in the midst of you know them passing away in the in the midst of um you know in the midst of this pandemic it gave my heart joy because they were able to um see the fruits of their labors and to enjoy it, you know, uh, the way they really wanted to. And to see that, you know, uh, now a grandson um, has inherited a $450,000 home that we paid for, but now it is appraised for over a quarter million dollars at this this rate. You know what I'm saying? And he's only 22 years old and he has a quarter million out of home paid for that he can live in right mortgage free you know what i'm saying so you know it 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 does pass on to the generation um the generations do appreciate it you know uh the generation it it is leaving a legacy it is leaving something uh bigger than what you already have it's leaving something uh bigger than what you already have for your families you know so when you think about urban gentrification, you know, as bad as it may uh, have been over the past uh, up 10 years, you know, now, you know, this is a chance. This is a chance for everybody to, you know, get that opportunity to live again. Janine, it has been awesome with you. It's always an awesome conversation with you. It's never a dull moment, you know? 
Um, I had met Janine uh, last October. She did a class. I became a Georgia realtor um, to teach us on home ownership and to teach us actually about the turn of the market. How does it look from a mortgage standpoint? Um, again, educating our customers on um, what it means to be communicating, you know, with your lenders right now. Um, if your income is shifted and, and those names. So it has always been a pleasure. We're going to come back again, Janine. Of course. You know, I could run my mouth about real estate forever. So Janine, we'll go ahead and let you close us out. And um, again, I do appreciate everybody for joining. I hope that we were able to answer all of the questions. I was trying to uh, keep another uh, Facebook up so I can see the questions come in, but I think we answered everybody's questions. Thank everybody for joining, uh, participating in this conversation, even listening. If you have any questions, you can DM me or Janine, both of us. We are happy to answer any of your questions. My name is Tamara Shaw. I am a realtor with Exit with EXP, excuse me, EXP Realty um, in Tennessee and Georgia. And again, it's been my pleasure. Yes, and, and again, my name is Janine Hunter. I am a loan officer with We Lending, um, owner of the Mortgage Chat LLC. Have been doing mortgage lending and housing counseling, it feels like forever, but really for the past 25 years. So thank you, Tamara, so much for bringing this idea about having this conversation because one of the things that everybody is on the bandwagon about in our community is building generational wealth. Yes. And for African Americans, our biggest asset is our homes. But the thing that we have to learn how to do is how to leverage that asset, not only so that we can build on the legacy, but that we have a legacy to leave behind. And for most people, they just have not had someone to put the ideas that we have talked about today into practice because someone who looks like them has never had this kind of, of conversation with them. My only concern, if you will, is that I wish that this could get to my seniors' ears because a lot of my seniors are not on Facebook. A lot of their children are. So if you have a parent that has a home that is has a small mortgage or, or, or is free and clear, have them get in touch with me or Tamara. We'd be more than happy to help them get to a point where they are comfortable because there's nothing worse than being in a home that is free and clear or has a very small mortgage on it, but you're not comfortable because your neighborhood is not the same. The house is inhabitable. And you have this feeling of despair because you don't feel like that you have no other alternative. Right. But we came to tell you tonight that you do. You just got to get in touch with the right people who are going to help you not be taken advantage of. Because unfortunately, especially for our seniors, they we have to protect them because so many people want to take advantage of them because they feel like that um they are not educated enough or they're not smart enough but our seniors are smart enough and that's why there's a lot of programs in place to make sure that our seniors are not taken advantage of especially as it relates to reverse mortgages because you have to take a, a counseling class stating that you understand everything that um, you're signing in on the real estate side, Tamara's going to make sure that you understand line by line, even if she has to go over it three or four times and have everybody who has their outside comments, because this usually involves a family meeting sometimes, she will have the family meeting uh, with individuals to make sure that you're making the best decision. But again, I never want a senior to ever feel like they have no hope because right. you do. You just have to talk to the right people who are going to get you where you want to go. And that's so that you are safe, you're, you're secure, you have you know, money to cover your food and your medicine. Because at, the, at this stage of the game, that's what life is for you. So again, uh, thank you so much. We'll have to maybe pick another topic next month and, and do this again. 
And maybe yeah. we'll talk about self-employed homeowners because, you know, self-employed borrowers, all, I mean, self-employed people always want to buy houses. So maybe we can talk about that next month. But again, it was- I mean, especially when we had so many self-employed people come self-employed between the pandemic. I mean, that's right. so important. Exactly. So let's put that on the books for next month. So yeah. thank you so much, Tamara. It was a pleasure talking with you and you have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Appreciate you. Bye.